I was walking past a charity shop and I spotted in the window a pop-up book called Inside the Personal Computer, an illustrated introduction in three dimensions. Also, a pop-up guide. So it's a pop-up book about old 80s computers. I bought it so fast I fractured time and space. So yes, um, this is indeed an exciting pop-up book about really bloody old computers. And look how the text has been justified at an angle. What isn't to love about this already? Uh, disappointingly, it doesn't give the name of the author or the year it was made. Fortunately, it has an international standard book number, so I just looked that up, and apparently it was written by Sharon Gallagher in December 1985. So there we go. I've got to say, though, the... Um technology inside it seems a little bit old for 1985 to me. Maybe it took a while to write. Maybe my memory's just horribly broken. And I never did actually spend three years living on the moon. Who cares? We've got a bloody cool pop-up book to look at and we can learn about old computers at the same time. Or maybe we'll just look at the pretties. Yeah, probably the latter. So, what happens when you first open it up? <coughs> hmm, my goodness. An entire computer grows in front of your face. And by computer, I mean cardboard facsimile. But hey, that's good enough. So yeah, look at that. Let's, let's have a spin. Ding, 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 ding. Look, it's even got uh, scuzzy ports on the back and stuff and weird red wires. One for the keyboard, one for the power, one assumes. Looking at the power socket, I wonder if this is an American book that was republished by Penguin. Hmm, that might mean it didn't come out here till 1987 or later. Wow, that was interesting. Anyway, let's see what we can do, because the best pop-up books give you a little bit of action stuff to do as well. And this is no exception. Let's learn about a computer. Computers are smart. Yep, that's kind of quite American as well, actually. Enough to play games, help teach students, and solve difficult problems that would take a person hours or even years to solve. But inside, computers are really quite simple-minded. Just like us, only with more bits of dirt stuck. Ooh, I wonder how many years that's been there. Scary. Um, so a yeah, keyboard, central processing unit, the monitor, software, etc. Oh, we know. Let's have a look at the cool thing. <laughs> so the, ooh, there's some wobbling going on on the screen. So... We've got the keyboard here, and you can play about... Ah, with the disc lock, look. Can we read? Can we get this to an angle where this will work? Probably not. Um, can I have a f yeah, you can't really... Ah, hang on. Well, it basically says at the top, not that I can make it out through the viewfinder at all, um, insert... Hang on, I can barely see it at all in this light, actually. Insert disc and close door, and then that changes to... Hello! I can't read this at all through the viewfinder. Isn't that fun, children? Um, hello. This book explains what I am and how I work. By the end, you'll know me inside out. Ah, plus you can look, remove the little old uh, five-inch floppy disk. Ah, those were the days when disks were flat and hats were potatoes. No, I've probably remembered that wrongly. Anyway, that's a basic computer, apparently. Show us something else cool. How about... A keyboard. Input. Computers do their thinking in a special language made up of electrical impulses. No, pulses. The machine's code only has two elements, on and off. And the third element, nectarin, which is unable to be used by humankind and causes the destruction of the universe. OK, I may have made that bit up. So yeah, there's a nice uh, brief explanation of the binary system. There's even a little... Uh, decimal to binary converter you can rotate and change. Look, so one is one. Zero is zero, and 17 is 10001. Hey, that's quite a nice little thing, that, isn't it? Teaches the kids while making things spin. There's a little thing about ASCII code down the bottom. Once heard somebody pronounce that as ASC2, which was quite impressive since it stands for American Standard Code for Information Interchange. Um, yeah, and it just tells you the ASCII code and the character and the binary equivalent. Again, that's quite a nice little thing. Memorise all that, and you'll have a very basic understanding of the letter M. Aren't you lucky? Oh, look, and here's a switch, which I presume shows you on and off. So it doesn't do anything. That, one, that one's broken. I presume this goes off somehow. Hang on. Ah, there, uh, 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 that one's broken, then. <clears throat> Let's have a look at the nice keyboard at the top. Um, so the idea is we can press the M key. Pat. Well, the M key is down. No. Let's just pull this and see what happens. Whoop. Oh yeah, pull that. The M key goes down, and it shows you on this little bar here whoop, the binary code that's happened. Hey, it's all pretty basic stuff, but I tell you what, the very basics don't change much over the years, do they? Obviously, they're still based on, you know, ons and offs and stuff like that. Ooh, my goodness. It's a box. 
a box of chips, but not the good kind you can eat and uh, feel ill afterwards. This is, unfortunately, just the insides of a computer. It's got RAM, random access memory, CPU, the central processing unit, and ROM, the Space Knight. Um, if you look inside the computer, you'll see a printed circuit board containing rows of plastic cases connected by conductor tracks. This is true. And look, there's some sort of chip on the inside. Ooh, that opens up. And tells you about electronic logic. How absolutely lovely. I believe electronic logic extends to kill all humans, and that's about it, really. What's on the back of this? Absolutely nothing. Really glad I turned it. In this little pocket is a stripey thing. Oh, I remember this. Look, you can fit your own chip. Wait for it. Here's my microchip, and I keep dropping it. And there we are. Let's put it in. In there like that. And uh, man, this is awkward. There we are. You are now a microelectronic engineer. Please connect your degree on the way out of the room. Right, let's pop that back in here and pretend we never put it in in case something goes wrong. That's quite nice, isn't it? Showing you all the basic bits. Oh, hang on. Oh, blimey. Flying discs. We've kind of already done that one, but here we are. There is just a disk drive on its own. Here, oh, ah, Cantona. Say, ooh, ah, Cantona. Right. If you pull that down, you get to see how the inside of the disc works there, with the old electromagnetic heads and stuff like that. And then you get to pull the disc in and out while the top of it's open, which would really upset a teacher if you did that in a school. And here, you can uh, pull this red thing. Oh, it just shows you the inside of the disc. That's the bit you don't stick your fingers on, because it's all electromagnetic and that. So yeah, I think the concept here is external memory, because sometimes you have to take data away from a computer and put it into another computer. Or indeed, there isn't anywhere to store it on the computer itself, because hard drives are the stuff of a madman's dreams, apparently. Hard disks can store between 5 and 50 megabytes of information, the equivalent of between 3,000 and 30,000 typewritten pages. Wow, hard disks can store between 5 and 50 megabytes of information. Imagine when this book was written, how expensive a 50 megabyte hard drive would have been. It would have been like at least 12 pence, maybe even 14. It would have been insane. Right, floppy disks. Well, that was exciting. Gonna be honest, not quite as exciting as some of the other pages, that one. Uh, quite like the box that came up. Not so sure about the other bits. Go on then. Oh, hang on. Floppy disk care. This should be good. The information stored on a disc can be lost if the magnetic surface of the disc is damaged. When handling a disc, you must be careful not to bend it or touch the exposed portions. Moisture, extreme temperatures, and small children covered in jam can also ruin discs. You should keep backup copies of all important discs and blah 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 discs. Disc, disc. Have you ever wondered, incidentally, why old discs used to be spelt with a K? It's not a weird affectation. It's because the disc, the D-I-S-C portion, is inside, and uh, the sort of plastic casing that it doesn't come out of unless you break it is called a diskette. D-I-S-K-E-T-T-E. -T -T -E. So disc with a K is short for diskette. And there we are. Now we've... Oh, God, there's a hair on it. I wonder, I wonder whose hair that is. How old is that hair? If only I had my own DNA testing lab, then I probably wouldn't have anywhere else in my house to live, because they take up loads of room, is my understanding. Anyway, next page. Oh, screens. Micro. Ah, this is the inside of the old cathode ray tube monitor. Computers would be useless if they didn't have a way of communicating their results, so monitors use semaphore. No, show the user what the computer is doing. Like an ordinary television set, the screen consists of a cathode ray tube, or CRT. Well, not anymore. We've all kind of gone um, LCD and OLED and all that these days, haven't we? Um, just cast my mind back to when... Uh, LCD monitors were quite new and the refresh rate was terrible and you try and play games on them and it felt like watching a weird blurry slideshow from hell. But anyway, nobody has a cathode ray tube television anymore because they're massive and they're heavy and they're really bloody expensive as compared to, an, well, not that you can buy one these days. You'd have to go second hand, wouldn't you? Which reminds me, I must get a Trinitron for uh, old retro game consoles. Ah, how irrelevant to this book was that. Right, let's pull this thing, what happens? String moves across. Oh, this one's a bit broken. But kind of shows you the uh, beam from the cathode ray there. Writing the word micro backwards. That was fun, wasn't it? <clears throat> Down here, there's, oh, there's not much going on. There's a big blank area for drawing your own notes. Right, oh, here we are. So this shows you things that could possibly be shown on a screen by a computer. Number one, games. This game being weird space shuttle simulator. Uh, oh, we've gone straight to number five, great. Graphics, yep, yeah, that's what we call a bar chart, or graph, or dull. Next up, 
a screen full of text you can't read. Yep, I remember those. That's database management, apparently. Spreadsheets, which again is kind of text you can't read. And finally, word processing, which really is the hat on uh, text you can't quite read here. Thanks for that. Right. Oh, last page. I was enjoying this. It's a printer! Oh my goodness. Serial and parallel interfaces. Computers can send electrical character codes to printers in serial or parallel form. That is entirely true, although kind of massively outdated. So yeah, the printer was an exciting thing at the time. Look, this computer can now make things physically real. What does this do? Oh, that's from the other page, isn't it? Bloody hell, I got all excited then. Ah, uh, pull this. Now that we've met, I'm ready to work and play with you. Let's zoom in a bit. Now that we've met, I'm ready to work and play with you. See you soon. Goodbye. Looks like a little print head as well. That's my impression of a dot matrix printer noise. Thanks. Thanks for coming out. Uh, just remember daisy wheel printers. I'm not going to mention them because they still give me headaches. Um, people still like to see their work the way they did before computers. On paper and carved onto stone tablets. When the printer receives electrical codes from the computer, it simply converts each string in the code into the corresponding letter or number and types the right character. The result is called hard copy. Hmm. Plotters and some printers can even reproduce computer graphics on paper. But as more and more people obtain access to computers, a new kind of paperless communication becomes possible. Instead of exchanging printed information, people can network or link their computers together over telephone lines. Wow, a little bit of absolutely correct prediction of the future there, which is rare for any of these 80s books. Hmm. A uh, hard copy, my god. Give us a hard copy of that, please, Sandra, because apparently everybody in the 80s office is called Sandra. Um, plotters. Plot if you've never seen a plotter, they're an amazing thing to watch. They were like, well, they probably still exist for certain applications, a row of pens and a little mechanical hand, and the hand would come across, grab a pen, and draw lines. So it was useless for, um, well, it's things like uh, certain types of text and small detail, but if you were doing sort of uh, vectored lines and that, it looked absolutely amazing. We had one at school and were never allowed to use it because it was too expensive. Let's zoom out a bit there. Ah, oh, that's better. Uh, operating systems, which ones do they list? Absolutely nothing. Um, it just lists that an operating system is actually a thing. Oh, there's the bloody hell, there's me explaining plotters and there's one down here. To get computer graphics off the screen and onto paper, you can use a plotter. The plotter has a mechanical arm and a set of coloured pens. First, the arm picks up one of the coloured pens. Then, yeah, I think we've kind of guessed how that works. And daisy wheel printers. Oh, God, they're actually mentioning them. I thought they were kind of uh, out of date even by 85. Daisy wheel or letter quality printers are slower than dot matrix printers, but because they use fully formed metal or plastic characters like a typewriter, they produce cleaner type. Yep, and it's really good unless you want to print something that it isn't exact letters in an exact size, at which point it becomes utterly frickin' useless. And finally, modems and networks. With the help of a modem, your computer can link up and communicate with other computers all over the world. The modem translates the computer's language of ons and offs into tones of different frequencies that are then transmitted across telephone lines. Ah, uh, who remembers the dial-up connection noise? At the receiving end, the process is reversed. A modem converts tone variations back into the computer's digital code. Computer networks are systems of computers linked together in this way. They are used to send and receive electronic mail, and to allow small personal computers access to the vast data libraries of larger computers and also to insult people's mothers when a child has lost a game on Xbox Live. Fantastic. It's still, you do know, there's something a little bit magical about a pop-up book, isn't there? You open it up, big cube, big square things, things sticking up, close it, goes all flat again. Ah. So there we are, that is inside the personal computer, and I think I paid probably far too much for it after seeing it on Amazon, but I got excited when I saw it, because I thought it would make an interesting video. And now we know absolutely everything there is to know about really outdated computers, except most things.